Hello, everybody, and welcome to Home Base Business Review with Carl Douglas. I'm your host, and we have some very interesting, a uh, very interesting interview today with a gentleman, uh, and he has. He's going to talk about his struggles. He's going to talk about his wins and his losses. But you guys, you know, get your piece of paper and pencil out and and take notes because he's going to cover some life changing information here. OK, so let's go ahead and bring him in. And uh, here we go. Michael, how you doing? Doing blessed and highly favored. Thank you, Carl. Glad to be here. <laughs> All right. We're excited to, to hear your story. Once again, everybody, this is Michael Price with um, Price's Possibilities, and he's going to talk about his struggles, the things that he overcome, and it's going to be a this will be part one. We will do a part two, so uh, definitely make sure you have your piece of paper and pencil handy. And and Michael, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and tell your story? We'd love to hear it. All right. Well, um, I, I like to tell the, the shorter version, but uh, I was born at a very young age. And I used to say, you know, uh, two parents, one male, one female, which used to be a joke because everybody assumed that was the case. But today things are different. But uh, long story short, I grew up in an alcoholic home and my father worked for the CIA. So we traveled all across the world to places that you don't want to be when you don't want to be there. So I already grew up feeling insecure, not good enough, questioning if I was loved, et cetera, et cetera. And then like we literally lived in Laos, you know, when the Vietnam War was going on from 1967 to 70. No radio, no TV, one paved road. Um, you know, the entire school system was kindergarten to 12th grade was a total of 300 kids. So you do the math, about 25 kids per grade were spread out all over the place. So had very few friends. It felt like World War Three inside my home even though war was going on around outside, you know, where we were living. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I grew up with this attitude, Carl, of, you know, when, when, uh, like when I was 14, I was started getting interested in girls. When I get a girlfriend, then everything will be okay. You know, when I get turned 16 and I can, you know, well, when we were prior to that, when we go back to the United States, you know, and I can see my friends again then everything will be okay. It wasn't. And then I was like, well, when I get a girlfriend, then everything, it wasn't. When I get 16 and I can drive, you know, that wasn't it either. When I get out of this crazy house, that wasn't it either. So um, I ended up, you know, when I was 15, uh, I went to my first uh, party where our, our high school was number one in the state in football. So when I went to the party, there were the football players. They had their jerseys on, the cheerleaders. They had their outfits on. And the freaks, you know, I looked down at them. But bottom line, there were these three different groups of people. And then there was me. You know, I felt like I didn't fit in anywhere. I had a couple beers. And I remember at the end of the night, I, I by the end of the night, I was rubbing elbows with the football players. I was talking to the cheerleaders. And I was like, wow, where has this been? You know, I thought alcohol was my, was the solution. It gave me the ability to be comfortable in my own skin, talk to people. I didn't care what people thought, but it got me in a lot of trouble. And the uh, shorter version is um, I went from drinking beer, smoking pot to when I went away to college, I started uh, I was be, quickly became a business major. And I learned that if I bought a quarter pound of pot, and I sold three ounces to my friends, I could get mine for free. And I thought, mm. I'm a business major. That's a pretty good business decision, right? I get <laughs> I get to party yes. for free, right? And, yes. uh, and, and actually, I was going to this college in Northwestern Maryland called Frostburg State College, which 15 years prior had been an all-girls college. I, I didn't have a girlfriend up until that time, so... Uh, Again, without the alcohol and the drugs, I, I, I was scared, intimidated, uncomfortable in my own skin, et cetera. But when I went to Frostburg, it was three to one girls to guys because 15 years prior, it had been a, an all women's teachers, you know, college. And uh, when I was there, I found out you could go to the dance and you could bring alcohol into the dance. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, I don't have to hide it anymore. Like I. I was living at home with mom and dad. 
So I went from that to I uh, put out a bowl of pot in my in my dorm room, had a bong there and anybody that came by was welcome. And and I uh, started dealing, you know, pot and then that progressed to other drugs. And I would walk into a bar and I had a fistful of money and I would be buying people drinks. I felt like I was John Wayne walking into a bar. everybody was happy to see me. So as long as I had money and pot, you know, people love me. You know? But uh, wrong. that didn't last long. You know, after two years, I got tired of the cold of Northwestern New Maryland. I transferred down to California to uh, sorry to Florida, uh, and then I got involved in cocaine, and then things got really bad. So long story short, um, in 1980, I ended up with 14 cents in my pocket the clothes on my back, people looking for me because I was fronted some drugs, some cocaine. I'd start doing it. I couldn't stop. There's a saying, you know, one's too many, a thousand's not enough. Um, and I ended up sleeping. I couldn't pay rent in my apartment. I dropped out of school, um, couldn't pay rent. And the only person that I thought was my friend was a guy who had uh, lived in a trailer park. So I was sleeping on his couch and I was going to the pawn shop every day with things that I had until I didn't have anything that they wanted anymore. So I can really uh, relate to people hitting bottom, what, you know, what some people call bottom. So there's bottom. And then I went way past bottom because I was out of money, owed people money. People were looking for me. I called my parents for money. I used to say for help, but I really wasn't wanting help. I just wanted to get out of trouble and I wanted to get away from the people that were looking for me. And uh, I was in Florida. The people that were looking for me were in Florida. My parents were in Maryland and they said, we'll have a ticket for you at the airport uh, and we'll put you in treatment or you're on your own. And that was the tough love that I needed. So I, I flew home thanks to my parents and uh, had a nice warm meal, slept in a nice warm bed, woke up the next morning and my parents were said, let's go to treatment. I'm like, I don't need to go to treatment. You know, I just, I'll just go back to drinking beer, smoking pot. I'll get, stay away from the hard drugs, stay away from the dealing and all that. And uh, they said, there's the front door. And so a great life lesson that I will share that I was in that treatment center for two weeks. I wouldn't admit that I had a problem. And there was some guy that came in that was a couple years older than me. He had been clean for about nine months. He had a pretty girlfriend with him. He had a car and his own place. And here I was in a treatment center and uh, broke, you know, and um, he had a message and his message was, if you want what we have, do what we do. And I was like, I want what you have. And uh, to summarize it, he said, what we do is we don't drink today. We don't do drugs today. And we go to a meeting. I was in a 12-step program called Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Mm -hmm. And thanks to the good Lord, I've been clean and sober since December 20th of 1980. Now, I had some, uh, yeah, all praise to the (laughs) Lord, glory to the Lord for that. (laughs) And my parents for putting me in there. Well, let me ask you this question, Michael. Um, This is for for the audience. I'm sure that they're thinking like, uh, so we see your struggle. We also can feel your pain, which you were going through, because who forget struggles? You have to remember where you came from, right? Right. But I noticed something because I know you. I've been knowing you now for over 10 years. You're so successful. You're very successful. So part two that we're going to have, we're going to talk more about the struggle, but I want to talk right now about the success. Let's let's, let's go into that for a second. Well, long story short, um, you know, what I found, like, like what this guy had said, if you want what we have, do what we do. And I was very attracted to the personal development community. Um, in particular, in the 1980s, I started listening to Tony Robbins, very attracted to his passion, to his energy, to his bio. You know, he worked with 
presidents, top athletes, et cetera. And, you know, and he had a program. And prior to that, I had bought um, a six audio cassette tape program from Nightingale Conan um, for $60, $59.97 or whatever, right? And um, that was the first thing I had invested in myself. And then when Tony came on, it was, he had these infomercials in the 1980s. And he had a program and it was three times that $179 or something. And to me, that was a big stretch, right? I was like, wow, that's, that's three times what Nightingale Conant's charging. But, you know, he had this money back guarantee and I had watched like five of his infomercials before he was like, like, what are you waiting for? You know, like you're, um, I've heard, I've heard a top marketer, a mentor I've followed, I joined his mastermind for $10,000 a couple of years ago. And he said, you know, your, your greatest success is often just on the other side of your yes. And, you know, I was, and a lot of, and another thing I've heard from a lot of top successful people is, you know, it's not a question of whether or not you have the resources. It's a question of whether or not you can be resourceful. And so I was holding on to the lie of I don't have enough two biggest lies in my life that I used to believe was I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. So if you believe, you know, like I did at the time, I don't have enough money. I didn't want to invest in myself. And that's the greatest investment you could ever possibly make is to invest in yourself. And so I did that program from Tony. And then long story short, years later, Tony was coming to, he, you know, he's from California. I was in Maryland at this time. You know, my parents got me back there. I stayed there and I was dating someone who didn't even really know who Tony Robbins was. And Tony was coming to Washington, D.C. And I got a phone call one day from um, what he called the field. Uh, I think they were called. I forget the acronym at the time, but, you know, people that work for him and they say, hey, Tony's in Washington, D.C., he only comes here once every two years, doing a four-day event, firewalk experience. We only got about 120 tickets left. My first question, again, with my old limiting belief about money, was how much is it? And they said, well, it's $597. Now, in my mind, I'm like, well, that's more than three times what I paid before, you know? And then the guy proceeded to say, well, your girlfriend's going. We got a better than money back guarantee. You know, if at the end of the first night, you're not happy, go to the back of the room, we'll refund your money in full. And you've had a whole day experience for free. And I was like, Oh man, how do I say no to that? So I said, yes. And then he upsold me. He's like, well, by the way, you know, in the first four rows for an extra hundred dollars, you could be in the first four rows. You could be right up front. You can spit on Tony practically, you know, and Blah blah blah. So I I paid the six ninety seven, and from there I'll end with this. Probably I went to uh, go to you know that was called uh, unleash uh, awaken the no unleash uh, unleash the giant within. I'm trying to remember now. It's been so long. U P W unleash. Uh, it'll come to me anyway. While I was waiting for that event to start. Uh, Tony's notoriously late. And so he was late and all the people outside the door were talking and a bunch of people were talking about Mastery University. So I asked, well, what's that? Well, that's Tony's top program. It's got three live events, blah, blah, blah. Maui, Hawaii for nine days and, you know, Aspen, Colorado, blah, 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 all this. And so my next question was, well, how much is that? Oh, that's seven thousand nine hundred ninety-seven dollars. I'm like, well, there's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the third night, you know, of his four-day event. Well, I'll talk about the, the, you know, third night he had the firewalk, and when the firewalk was there, I'm standing in the back of the line. I'm watching everybody walk across these hot coals. Like, are they burning their feet? Because I watched them build a fire, you know, and it's supposedly like 2000 degrees. I'm like, I don't want to get burned. And um, so I watched and I watched and I watched and the whole mo- thing was you were supposed to look up past the end of the firewalk and, and visualize where you want to be in your life. 
So it was a great metaphor for life. Like this fire is right in front of you. Are you going to focus on the fire that's in front of you? Or are you going to focus on your dream and where you want to be? And so we were supposed to do that, you know, focus on that while you walk across the hot coals, you get to the other side, wipe your feet and celebrate. So finally, after watching older people, younger people, you know, women, other people do this, that I looked at like, well, if they can do it, I should be able to do it. I finally decided, okay, I'm going to walk across the coals. I walk across the coals. I'm looking up. Da, 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 I get to the end. I forgot to wipe my feet and celebrate, which is a great metaphor for life. And maybe we'll talk about that in part two. But so I did that. And then the end of that third night, Tony gave his invitation to attend Master University. I'm getting all emotional now because I ran to the back of the room, Carl. Um, I knew I had to be there. I knew that one of Tony's sayings is for things to change, you must change, you know? And uh, it changed my life. It literally changed my life in so many ways because this, you know, when I was in fifth grade, I'll tell this brief little story. I was so shy and fearful of other people. I was in class. My teacher wanted me to get up and give a book report, you know, a report in front of my classmates. And I was so fearful of what people would think of me. I couldn't get out of my chair. He's like, I'm going to flunk you if you don't get up here and do your report. And I just took the F. And that's who I used to be. And mm. Firewalk was, and more importantly, saying yes, like I said, your greatest success often lies on just on the other side of your yes, and saying yes to Master University and being surrounded by not just Tony and Tony's top mentors, but thousands of other people who were committed to a similar way of life gave me the life connections, the information, and so forth that changed the way I think, changed what I did. And, you know, I ended up starting my own business many years later, uh, Priceless Possibilities. I started in 1996, but I moved in 1995 after having been in Maryland for 15 years, having all these great friends, a home there, da, 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 well loved in the community. And uh, I wanted to be close to where Tony worked so that I could work with him. And so I left everything, moved out to California, and long story short, in a short period of time, became one of just 10 trainers paid by Tony to literally travel around the world with him at his live public seminars, doing one-on-one -on -one group coaching of his key participants. And that opened up a world of, you know, that changed my life. That's why I got super emotional, was like that one decision that said yes to run to the back of the room and, you know, pay seven thousand, invest, I should say, $7,997. This is back in, I think, 92 when I did that. Um, and that doesn't include airfare, rental car, food, you know, all that other stuff. It was well over $10,000. Was one of the greatest investments I've ever made in my life. Well, Michael, I got, I got to say, you know, when I met you, um, the system you created was life-changing for me, okay? Um, I always have been an, at heart an entrepreneur, but I wanted to understand how to make a lot of money with multi-level marketing and one up, two up systems. And the system that you had and the company we were working with put a lot of money in my pocket. I was one of their top leaders, okay? And I was a young man at that time. But I want to thank you for being the person you are to hear your story, it touched me, okay? And a lot of uh, a lot of you out there who are watching, watching the show right now, I'm sure that you're struggling, you're going through things, but guess what? There's, on the other side of the fire, there's your future. We can't do so much about your past, but we can do a lot about that future, okay? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to go through the fire in your life, and sometimes you have to do it by yourself because you're feeling the pain. If you break your leg or get in a car accident and, and you go to the hospital, who's gonna be laying in the bed? You are, okay? You can heal yourself with God's blessing, okay? But you must understand, 
our second part, when we when we invite Mike, Mike, would you come back and share some more of your story? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. And and I'm I'm looking forward to hearing. I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of a lot of people are gonna be sending in thank yous. I'm gonna thank you right now, Mike, <laughs> because I know they will, because a lot of people are feeling pain. And this the whole reason why Home Based Business Review was created let you know, yeah, life is full of pain, but it does not destroy you. It will not destroy you. Don't let it destroy you. Okay, become the great person that God created you to be. Release, let it go, I always say. Okay, so so Mike, I know we, we run out of time. Two minutes, tell tell um, the audience here, we ever heard uh, basically what you went through, some of it, and of course, it's more to the story. Uh, Tell them some more, some of your accomplishments in two minutes and then and also tell them why you keep fighting still today. Well, I'll probably start with why I'm still, still fighting today is because I remember uh, where I came from. And that's a really important lesson is to never forget. But for the grace of God, I had a plaque on my wall for 20 years after I, I got out of that treatment center and it said, but for the grace of God, there go I. You know, and it's it, it was really important for me to remember where I came from. I I worked six days a week my first year out of out of that treatment center and my day off. I would go to a child adolescent unit where they had 13 to 18 year olds. And uh, I went in there with the desire that I could have, even if it was just one. Of course, I wanted all of them to. Um, to hear my experience, strength, and hope, and not go down the same path that I did. Um, I won't go into the details, but I committed a crime under the influence. I'm not proud of it. I didn't intend to, but I got off on a technicality, and, the, and a couple other people that were with me got many years in jail. Um, so I remember, but for the grace of God, I could have been dead in jail or in, in an institution. Uh, so I try and have that attitude to be humble every morning that you know, one thing, uh, there's a verse in the good book that, that I like to read the most called the Bible that says, you know, do not boast about a day for, you know, not what a day may bring. What does that mean? That means, you know what? Some people didn't wake up this morning, but I did. Some people won't wake up tomorrow. It could be me. So to be grateful and thankful for what I have is a much better way to live than the way yes. that, I, that I used to live. So I'm very grateful for that. I did learn that uh, without going into the details, and we can talk about that on part two, that there are, uh, there's a lot of wisdom. You know, I, I love the book of Proverbs. It's, it's wisdom to be an entrepreneur rather than being an employee. There's a lot of wisdom to be a kingdom entrepreneur, to do it God's way rather than do it the way I was doing it, you know, my way. Um, so there's, there's a lot of wisdom in being an entrepreneur and doing things a certain way that will lead you to be a blessing um, to other people, which I love Zig Ziglar's quote, you know, if you want to help enough other people, you want to get what you want, help other people get what they want, basically. So in other words, don't worry about yourself. See how you can serve other people. You know, uh, I'm very open and very bold about my faith. So I'll end with that. I'll just say, you know, there's another verse in the Bible that says Jesus came to be a servant. So the king of kings could have been anything, but he came to serve. So he came to be a servant. How long did he do that? Unto death. So the verse says three things. Jesus came to be a servant. So how should I, if you're a home-based business person, you know, how, how, what should you do to be successful? Be a servant. How long should you be a servant? Unto death. The last part of that verse says, death even on a cross. What does that mean? That means it was uncomfortable. It was painful. Literally, he laid down his life for, for you and me, right? Um, yes. What does that mean in terms of being an entrepreneur? Should I only serve when it's comfortable, when it doesn't cost me any money, when I don't look foolish? Or should I serve all the time unto death, even when I look foolish, even if it costs me money, even if you don't like me? Um, so I've learned that that's a great prescription for life. And that's what's opened up a lot of doors and shut a lot of doors, which is a good thing, you know, 
there are certain people and uh, situations, you know, that that are not in my best interest. Um, and so, you know, being who I am and serving unto death, that even on a cross like Jesus, um, you know, will shut a lot of doors, but it will also open a lot of doors too. Well, you know, Michael, I, I, once again, I want to say thank you for sharing your life stories and your Bible verses and your spirit. Um, we all want to say thank you here at Home Base Business Review. Looking forward to bringing you back, my friend. Okay. And uh, all of you, if you have anything that you would like to uh, to send to Home Base Business Review, you're more than happy. Next time when we bring Mike on, we can ask those questions. So for right now, this is Carl Douglas from Home Base Business Review saying thank you guys for spending your time with us today. And we we'll look forward to seeing you on part two. Thank you, Michael. Thank you and God bless you. God bless you too.